All right, fifth grade, another social studies lesson today. Last time, <clears throat> lesson three was on big cities. We learned about how different things like electricity and steel frames for buildings were made it possible for these huge cities to spring up. And then you had all of these job opportunities with factories growing. Today we have lesson four, which is uh, all about reform, all about different progressives trying to get laws changed to make society better and to make working conditions better. Make sure that you have your notes out. Make sure that you have a pencil out. There are a few things that you can write down for this. This is the last lesson of the chapter, uh, lesson four, which means you'll have a social studies test. Now, the social studies test is going to be open book, open note, uh, and you can use the study guide, which I uploaded to Teams in the Social Studies channel. You can use all of those things during your test. So when I tell you to write something down, make sure you're careful about it. Make sure you get down the important information that you need. All right, chapter 15, last lesson of the chapter, lesson four. We have a time of reform. So today, our objectives... We want to describe the goals and the achievements of various progressive reform movements and summarize attempts by women and African Americans to gain recognition for their rights. First, we start with the progressives. So factories at this time in the early 1900s, about 1900 to 1920, very dangerous places. They don't have a whole lot of laws to protect their workers. So it was very dangerous and people could get injured or killed on the job. And so you have these progressives that come up or reformers. They came along with the goal to try to make cities and factories cleaner and safer. So um, their thought was that uh, governments should make laws to protect their workers, consumers, and citizens' rights. So they wrote and took pictures of these uh, different unsafe working condi conditions. Uh, these are known as muckrakers. So a muckraker is someone who rakes up or points out unpleasant truths that people probably don't like to hear, but they're true and they think people need to hear those things. A famous muckraker was Upton Sinclair, who wrote The Jungle. Um, in this book, The Jungle, she talks about the conditions at meatpacking plants and how disgusting they were. Uh, I'm actually going to read you... Uh, some excerpts from the jungle so you can hear exactly how how gross and disgusting the workplace was there so here's uh some pictures of some things you might have seen at the meat packing plants and and you also have a picture of uh the jungle here the cover of the book that upton sinclair wrote to try to open everyone's eyes to the type of working conditions that factories and meat packing plants had up to Sinclair's The Jungle, um, uh, he described uh, the filthy conditions of the meat packing industry in this book that he wrote. Um, this takes place in Chicago during the early 1900s. And as I read you some of these excerpts from The Jungle, uh, you'll see just exactly how disgusting the working conditions were that these people were using. So, uh, the first one talks about workplace hazards. Workplace hazards basically mean uh, dangers in the workplace, things at your job that are dangerous to you. So <clears throat> here's, what, here's what he wrote here. It says, let a man so much as scrape his finger pushing a truck in the pickle rooms and he might have a sore that would put him out of the world. All the joints in his fingers might be eaten by acid one by one. Of the butchers and the floorsmen, all those who used knives, you could scarcely find a person who had the use of his thumb. Time and time again, the base of it had been slashed off until there was a mere lump of flesh against which the man pressed a knife to hold it. The hands of these men would be crisscrossed with cuts until you could no longer pretend to count them or to trace them. They would have no nails, they had worn them off, pulling hides. Their knuckles were swollen so that the fingers spread out like a fan. There were men who worked in the cooking rooms in the midst of the steam 
and sickening odors by artificial light. In these rooms, the germs of tuberculosis might live for two years, but the supply was renewed every hour. There were beef luggers who carried 200-pound quarters to the refrigerator cars, a fearful kind of work that began at 4 o'clock in the morning and that wore out the most powerful men in years. There were wool pluckers whose hands went to pieces even sooner. For the pelts of the sheep had to be painted with acid to loosen the wool. Then the pluckers had to pull out this wool with their bare hands until the acid had eaten their fingers off. There were those who made the tins for the canned meat, and their hands, too, were a maze of cuts. Each cut represented a chance for blood poisoning. Reusing waste is another issue they had in these factories. Um, it seemed that he was working in the room where the men prepared the beef for canning, and the beef had lain in vats of chemicals, and men with great forks speared it out and dumped it into trucks to be taken to the cooking room. When they had speared out all they could reach, they emptied the vat on the floor. And then with shovels, they scraped up the balance and dumped it into the truck. The floor was filthy, yet they set people with mops sopping the meat into a hole that connected with a sink where it was caught and used over again. And if that were not enough, there was a trap in the pipe where all the scraps of meat and odds and ends of, of refuse were caught, and every few days it was an old man's task to clean these out, shovel their contents into one of the trucks with the rest of the meat. The usage of chemicals. I think this is by far the most disgusting thing I read about the conditions at the meat packing plants. Here's what it says. There was never the least bit of attention paid to what was cut up for sausage. There would come all the way back from Europe old sausage that had been rejected, that was moldy and white. It would be doused with borax and glycerin and dumped into the hoppers and made over again for home consumption. There would be meat that had tumbled out onto the floor in the dirt and sawdust. There were workers that had trampled and spit uncounted billions of consumption germs. There would be meat that was stored in great piles and rooms, and the water from the leaky roofs would drip over it, and thousands of rats would race up on top. It was too dark to see these storage places, to see it well at least, but a man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of dried dung of rats. Th these rats were nuisances, and the packers would put poison bread out for them. They would die, then the rats, the bread, and the meat would all go into the hoppers together. This is no story and no joke. The meat would be shoveled into carts, and the men who did the shovel shoveling would not trouble to lift out a rat, even if he saw one. Absolutely disgusting working conditions that they had to work in. So with all this protesting and uh, the more that people found out about the different conditions, uh, you had the government that did step in and make reforms. Uh, president Theodore Roosevelt, he was president at this time. And so he passed the two, two big acts, the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act. And basically what these did is that it had different laws about medicines and foods that they could not be made with harmful chemicals and that factories had to maintain a level of cleanliness. You couldn't just let filth build up day after day, week after week, month after month, because they knew that that would be unhealthy for the things that those factories produced. Also, he set aside millions of acres for national parks. Um, this happened after he saw Yosemite National Park. So sit back, enjoy this tour of Yosemite National Park.
right, so uh, <clears throat> that wasn't that was just one thing that people were protesting was the, the uncleanliness of cities and factories and the poor working conditions, but also people were working for equal rights. You can see in the background here, you have what uh, you have women's rights um, that they're protesting for. Voting rights for women, yeah. So women still weren't able to vote after or before the Civil War. They still weren't able to vote, and so uh, they protested this. They thought they should be able to vote. And finally, in 1920, uh, three-fourths of the states in the United States ratified the 19th Amendment, which allowed women to have the right to vote. Um, other people that were still fighting for equal rights were uh, minority races, African Americans, Mexican Americans, American Indians, Asian Americans. They still were all facing prejudices in the law and they were getting equal treatment from society. It was tough for them to find jobs. Um, and so one association that formed was the NAACP, uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In 1909, it was started and Webb Du Bois was the, the leader, W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, go ahead and write, make sure you write him down, the leader of the NAACP. Here are some constitutional amendments. Go ahead and pause the video so that you can write down uh, the amendment and what it did. Here you have the goal that the progressives were trying to achieve, um, but you don't need to write down the part on the left just as long as you have 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th Amendment, and then what each of them, what law they each pass. So 16th allowed Congress to pass income tax. 17th allowed citizens to elect senators. 18th made it against the law to sell alcoholic beverages. The 18th Amendment was prohibition. That's now, uh, that was taken away. It was... Um, uh, taken out of the Constitution. So it used to be a law. It's not a law anymore. And then the 19th, which recognized the right of women to vote. All right, our summary. During the early 1900s, progressives wanted laws to protect workers, customers, and citizens' rights. Laws were passed to make food safer and conserve land, and women won the right to vote. Many organizations, including the NAACP, fought prejudice and injustice. All right, fifth grade, that is it for our fourth lesson in this chapter 15. You will have a test. The test will be on Thursday, okay? I'm going to show you where to find the study guide for that test. Uh, remember, you can use the study guide as you're taking the test. It'll be online, kind of like uh, the Statue of Liberty quiz was online and how your math quiz was online. It will be an online test. You can use your book. You can use your notes you can use the study guide. And I'm gonna show you where to find that study guide in Teams. All right, fifth grade, so I am in Teams. Uh, this is what it should look like for you if you're using a computer. If you're using an iPad, it might look a little bit different. But you just go to your social studies channel here, channel number six, and then up at the top, you can see files. If you click on files up here, then you can see all the materials that I have uploaded here for you, okay? so. One of these, oh, right there, Chapter 15 Online Study Guide. If you click on that, you can view it inside of Teams. Or, if you would like, you can download it. And then you can print it off at home, or you can just copy it down on a piece of paper and fill these things out. You can use this uh, while you take your test. All right? Another thing you could do, you could download it, and you could uh, highlight and copy and paste things into another document and then you can fill it out digitally if you'd like to do that instead. That is totally fine. That is how you find your study guide in Teams. <laughs>